All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to this. Welcome to this DCMI and ACES joint webinar. My name is Stuart Sutton and I'll serve as Managing Director of Dublin Core and today's presenter, uh, introducer. Um, the webinar series itself uh, is a joint effort of, of ACES and DCMI and webinars are provided as a service to members of both organizations. Uh, the webinars are intended to report and instruct on research and work that advances both the discourse and innovative practice of metadata. Today's presenter, Dr. Eric Miller, is co-founder and president of Zephyra. Eric serves as an advisor to businesses and other organizations on the evolution of the web. Until 2007, Eric led the semantic web activity for the World Wide Web Consortium at MIT. Um, as part of those duties, he was responsible for uh, the architectural and technical leadership in the design and evolution of the semantic web. He also served at MIT, at MIT as a research scientist at the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory and was a principal investigator on the MIT Simulate project focusing on development of open source tools based on semantic web technologies. Previously, Eric was a senior research scientist at OCLC Online Computer Library Center and was co-founder and associate director of the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative. In 2012, uh, Zephira partnered with the Library of Congress uh, to produce BitFrame, a linked data model for bibliographic data that meets the needs of Ferber and RDA while setting the stage for broader access and use of bibliographic information as linked data. In July of this year, Zephira launched the LibHub initiative, which uh, aims to use the BibFrame linked data model to increase the web visibility of library assets and to offer an opportunity to explore the promises of linked data and BibFrame for libraries. And it's in the context of these latter activities that we frame today's webinar. Uh, you will have an opportunity at the close of Eric's presentation to ask questions. We ask that you hold off entering questions into the questions form on, you see on the screen until we near the close of the presentation. So welcome Eric, and I turn the platform over to you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm not quite sure where everyone is coming in, so how about good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending. Um, uh, thanks for joining me. I find uh, uh, webinars to be um, uh, a bit impersonal, so I'm going to just use this opportunity to wave to everybody. Um, uh, I'm coming in at the moment and uh, presenting this um, from uh, uh, right outside of Columbus, Ohio, um, where it's a sweltering 11 degrees at the moment and, and dropping accordingly. So if uh, folks are um, enjoying a little bit more warmer, warmer climate, uh, uh, please let me know, and I shall live vicariously through you for a while. Um, what what is keeping me a little bit uh, uh, warm, however, is 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 really the oh, this is a hello, okay. Um, this is a this is a uh, uh, a recent initiative that. We've been fortunate to um, be part of, uh, but but really it's it's a culmination of a lot of work over the past 20 years in in really sort of weaving the best of libraries, the web, and data together. And in particular, what I'm going to be talking about today is um, sharing some of the the findings um, from the field uh, and early uh, practitioners' perspective um, over the past year of of exploring. Um, linked data libraries, BibFrame, schema.org, and, and web visibility in the context of libraries. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how descriptive linked data standards and discovery linked data standards complement each other. 
um, and explore really the, the opportunity of accelerating um, uh, the web visibility of libraries through that process. And uh, finally introduce the LibHub initiative as a way of accelerating that um, and really sort of transforming uh, at a very local level how libraries are viewed on the web, but potentially as an industry, um, what, what opportunities of weaving libraries into the very fabric of the web uh, provide. Um, so uh, this is a webinar in three acts. Um, act one is background and context. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Zafira really as a way of just sort of providing uh, um, some background on, on how we approach um, uh, various problems and, and, and really just sort of, you know, the philosophy of who we are and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, we're a, we're a passionate, experienced group of, of, of experts that have come together from a, a very wide range of different perspectives, um, from uh, industry, from academia, um, from uh, uh, nonprofits, but, but really sort of centering around these various different perspectives with a love of, of the web, data, libraries, open standards, open solutions, and, and a constant state of learning. Um, we've been fortunate to, to grow quite significantly in, in the past um, several years, and, and really what you're seeing here isn't a list of our clients, but really the um, backgrounds of the companies and organizations that, that many of the folks of Zafira um, are part of. In part, just to sort of get a better understanding of, you know, where we come from and, and our backgrounds and how we sort of view the world. Um, from the particular perspective of libraries, um, we've been involved with a wide range of, of different uh, initiatives um, that, that really have further shaped uh, what I'll be discussing today. So certainly from the standard side of, of this and um, large-scale global web scale standards um, specifically in the context of, of the World Wide Web Consortium um, but also in applying those strategies um, to organizations to more effectively shape their linked data strategies. Um, in particular OCLC and Library of Congress are good examples of how Zafira has been uh, working together with these institutions to to really sort of see how um, together we can use the web to its full potential. Um, we've been involved in in very um, uh, uh, large scale descriptive and discovery uh, standards and technologies. As Stuart mentioned, um, we were the early architects of BidFrame, um, but we've been involved with Schema.org uh, before it was announced and. And frankly, even you know the variants of, of these kind of, of descriptive vocabularies um, that that predate this, and and will continue. Um, we've applied this in very large scale um, projects, including the National Library Board of Singapore and the National Library of Medicine. We've been involved in several activities related to rethinking the future of 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 library systems, including the IMLS funded project with UC Davis called Bibflow. And um, uh, these various lessons um, really, with a, with a strong theme of visibility, um, have been part of our key focus on um, our latest large-scale project, which is LibHub. And I'll talk a little bit more about that going forward. I think it's also important to basically understand um, not just our perspective, but the perspective of, of, of you know, our view in the context of the web. The web enables many different perspectives. There's no right and no wrong, um, but the utility of these perspectives is frankly just another perspective, and that's by design. What, what we're going to talk about today is um, these different perspectives that we heard with working with hundreds of different um, professionals over the past year, trying to better understand the implications of linked data and libraries, and, and to share that perspective from what we've heard, coupled with our professional experiences in working both within the library community, but also in um, uh, a wide range of different vertical markets that Zafira is currently engaged in, and share some of these observations along the way. 
um, share the observations that we've heard and that we've discussed and that we've been uh, participating in the past year that, you know, and, and just baseline some of these observations from, from these professionals. That, you know, in fact, a, a library is more than its collection. As a, as a technology company, we might think about data and we might think about the catalog, but, but it's been very clear from working with libraries um, and the professionals that, that in fact, the catalogs um, are just one facet of a larger uh, service in which the library are, are, are engaged in. Um, the other is that linked data, one of the things, this is a very strong theme, a very strong meme. I'm, I'm, as someone that's been involved with these standards and technologies and practices before uh, even the name, what's been really exciting is sort of the watch the evolution of, of, of this adoption curve. Um, but, but what's been um, equally um, interesting to observe is that, that we, we seem to be focusing more on the data and far less on the linking. And what we have very strong evidence and benefit from is that if we sort of re remind ourselves that the linking is first and the data is second, that this has much stronger implications in terms of value add along the way. Um, another shared observation is that, in fact, the web of data is here. Um, the web has become a far more actionable um, uh, environment. It's become far more personal, far more localized. Um, the, the, cap the capacities in which the web enables have, have really accelerated in, which, um, in how we discover new information. Uh, and, and that is a very exciting trajectory to see um, happen from a set of web of documents to a set of web of data to the actions that can begin to occur um, on such a web. And, and I'll talk a little bit about how this is um, happening in a, in, a, in a range of different industry verticals. But to share the final observations, libraries are not participating to their full potential in the opportunities that, that are not in the future, but simply right now. Um, and so part of what we're interested in doing is sort of talking about how to accelerate that. Another perspective that's an important part of this um, from, from how we view this is, is really along the lines of, of, of you know, a strategy and philosophy that is reflected in, in sort of product design called the minimal viable product. Um, we reflect this in a wide range of, of, of additional facets than just products, but it's a great um, uh, perspective in terms of incremental value and continuous learning. Many of us in the library community, or in, when we start to think about how we want to design, for example, um, vocabularies or schemes or, 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 or um, uh, uh, metadata descriptive uh, frameworks, um, you know, we have a tendency of sort of designing them in this top trajectory. So, for example, if we are interested in replacing something like Mark, um, only after we finish dealing with all of the additional capacities in which Mark provide will we be satisfied. So, at every step of the way, um, we're not satisfied until the very final product. Whereas the bottom trajectory, if we're after you know, improved bibliographic description that will not only replace Mark but go beyond it, every step of the way we can um, see how we achieve a particular goal and incrementally are satisfied and incrementally see value at every step. And that through that process of incremental value, through that process of continuous learning, um, that is a key part in terms of our design. From a data perspective, um, another key part of our design is sort of small is beautiful, very simple designed primitives that allow us to combine these small building blocks to create larger and larger structures. Um, RDF as a data standard provides some very simple capacities um, but very precisely engineered capacities that allow us to create small descriptive um, components, but, but together can be assembled into larger and larger and larger shapes. And if we look at bib frame from this capacity, we can start to see um, a set of additional key building blocks that are common to the library, museum, archival community 
that, that really serve as an accelerated way in which we can begin to project our information that, that more effectively we can snap together. On a, on a, on a similar parallel trajectory, um, what's happening right now in the search engine community is a, is a fantastic um, uh, intersection where very different business models from Microsoft, Google, Yahoo, Yandex, etc., have have recognized that they have a shared interest in providing more structure on the web. And schema.org is a way in which these groups have have combined their common requirements and said, look, if there's any way in which we can add more structure to the web, we can each do individually interesting things and provide additional value over and above um, you know, our customers. So in this particular case, the customers might be you know, not just the users that search, but frankly, advertisers or different kinds of, of, of service providers in which the search engines generate revenue. But the key point is a theme in which more structured information um, can be injected into the web and as from the end user, a rapid way in which we can see benefit from this. What's been powerful in this context from the descriptive building block standards to the search engine discovery standards is this shared notion of, of the web as a more connected set of data. The notion of using the web as an architecture, and, and by that I mean um, the building blocks in which the web um, are, are constructed, identifiers, links, etc., as a way of sort of sharing and connecting data. And this has been a very powerful way in which different communities have begun to accelerate their asset sharing in a, in a decentralized web environment. From a library perspective, however, I want to sort of, um, we can apply some general technology um, um, patterns to sort of see how these fit very nicely, frankly, with our trajectory into this particular space. Um, on the left-hand side, this is a general technology hype cycle curve, um, uh, but, but it, it actually applies, I think, very well into the concept of linked data and the concept of linked data in particular in library adoption. Um, early on the left hand side we have this notion of technology triggers, the, the notion of some pretty interesting ideas. There's generally a lot of interest. After a while, I, I love this sort of slope into the trough of disillusionment. Uh, in fact, one of the things that is not demonstrated here in the hype cycle is, is, is generally most technologies end right there. Um, for those that continue and have um, um, uh, you know, a, a viable product life cycle ahead and show business value, you slowly basically build back up into the slope of enlightenment. Um, at this time, you've got a larger um, majority adoption um, that, that generates a series of, of, of interesting products and services and, and ultimately um, uh, projects into this plateau of productivity. We, we can apply a very similar approach um, really in sort of linked data bib frame adoption, um, uh, linked data library adoption really in, in the context of, of libraries. Again, left hand side being technology enthusi enthusiast, visionaries, re really representing the early market. The right hand side being sort of the mainstream market, pragmatists, conservative skeptics, etc. But this huge gap um, that, that frankly has to be crossed in order to go from early market to mainstream market. Again, most technologies, most ideas have a tendency of ending right in the, in the particular early market. The, early, the experimenters and early implementers are, are quick to sort of explore this, but when we want to get to the mainstream market of data publishers, uh, general workflows, back office systems, this is where it becomes increasingly um, challenge if we, if we frankly just don't cross that chasm. We can identify roles in this space to clarify the space, test certain assumptions, draft standards, but, but really the key parts in this is just understanding increasingly where each of us sit 
on this particular space. And that is an important, again, perspective that is critical in terms of understanding um, not only where we're at, but, but when we will see the most benefit. If you are interested in, um, you know, basically using linked data in the back office, you know, you are, you are towards the end of the mainstream market. Um, if you're interested in sort of exploring, um, you know, very early uh, prototype environments, you're, you're in the early market perspective. What we're trying to do in LiveHub is, is really provide a very practical, focused way of showing immediate value, specifically in the context of visible data, in which the web can understand, increasing that value as a way of showing the value proposition to, to go from early market to mainstream market. There's a, in the lower part of this slide, there's a variety of projects that, that in fact are exploring um, you know, early market potential of linked data, uh, mainstream market adoption of, mid, of, of linked data, and towards the end, back office um, integration of linked data. And again, depending on where you're at on this spectrum, these different projects are helpful to track as to find out where we're at. But what we're trying to achieve in LibHub is really a recognition that in order to go to the mainstream, we really have to show incremental value of what we're trying to achieve. If linked data, if our goals for linked data, and in fact our goals for BibFrame, are simply to replace our existing standards, then the time in which that will take is, is you know, will, will be quite significant. If our goal is to show far more value than our current um, interchange formats, far more valuable value than our current data um, standards, in terms of, say, visibility, discovery, more people coming to our library and seeking out our assets, that shows, that gives us an opportunity of sort of creating a much stronger way in which we can accelerate um, the market and, and ultimately um, project these technologies into uh, mainstream much, much more effectively, much quicker. So, okay, Act 1 was just some background and context and frankly some, some underlying perspective. Act 2, our focus here is really speaking like the web. 25 years ago, you know, roughly in March, um, Tim Berners-Lee sketched out an information management proposal that became the basis of the World Wide Web. Um, this was an initial proposal that, that had a set of interconnected resources that linked together across different architectural systems. Um, if you dig into the, these particular standards, you get this kind of structure. Um, to reduce a tremendous amount of really incredible standards and technologies into one slide, um, the web is really about decentralized identifiers, being able to create an identifier for anything and not having a centralized environment um, to, to, to say what can or can't be identified. Links and relationships among these assets. So being able to describe not only a particular resource but how it links to another resource. And then the services in which one can click on those, traverse those, act upon those accordingly. The three basic building blocks of the web are identifiers, relationships, and services. And, and the, the structures in which we create our web documents and our web assets, um, you know, how we mark that up, how we reflect that as a way to a machine to consume is reflected in a wide range of markup standards, data standards, et cetera, et cetera. This is our standard in the library community. So as cryptic as the HTML web standards might look to some, um, our MARC standards look as cryptic to others. But the interesting aspect is that there are strong parallels here in terms of the entities and relationships that exist in our world and how they can be projected into a web world very effectively. We are talking about, both in the context of the web and in the context of Mark, people, places, 
subjects, organizations, and the relationships that link them together. We have implied linkages in the context of a record. We're talking about a book, or we're talking about a manuscript, or we're talking about some particular kind of resource. But if we take that implicit relationship and begin to make that explicit, we have an opportunity for reflecting how we speak in our library community in which the way the web understands. Zafira was asked several years ago to look at different linked data environments and to propose a common linked data model that would support a wide range of bibliographic and descriptive needs. We looked at a wide range of, of libraries, museums, and archives from national, local, regional perspectives. Um, and in fact, the analysis of, of, of these, these hundreds of different implementations, one of the common things was they were all talking that they were linked data. The other was they were all doing things very differently. Um, even though they might have been using Dublin Core or FOF or SCOS, you know, different vocabularies that, that were relatively common among um, many different communities, how they were using those vocabularies, how they were um, linking to assets, how they were describing assets, how they were, in fact, you know, using such thing as DC Creator. Um, the patterns of usage were, frankly, all absolutely different. But one of the things that were common was this attempt to try and start to break up the descriptions of concepts and carriers and start to relate things um, that, that, that were associated with concepts and some of the things that were associated with carriers. And, and so as we were deconstructing patterns uh, across you know, these many different linked data initiatives, um, we kept converging to a common model that, that became a useful control point for bibliographic description, something that we could project these different perspectives into, and in that projection, have a better chance of sort of snapping things together. Um, and, and further, provide something that could be simple, simple but replicable that we could extend and refine and, and expand to address a wide range of additional perspectives or additional needs. Uh, one of the early perspectives we had in the Dublin Core was keep the simple things simple and make the complex things possible. That was reflected again in a lot of the standards in terms of RDF. Make the simple things simple and the complex things possible. And further now in the context of bib frame, make the simple things simple and the complex things possible. And, can, and identify a set of simple patterns that could be repeated so that you could have that kind of consistency but by chaining these patterns together, begin to describe more and more and richer and richer complex assets. As we spent time um, explaining these particular um, approaches and explaining the value and, and exploring um, um, different aspects of, of linked data and bid frame adoption, what we heard from working with hundreds of different professionals was the need for, in essence, a, a practical way in which folks could come together and, and learn. And at first it was um, in the form of content, training, um, training assets. But it quickly became clear that, that what, was, what was really needed was a need for the intersection between not just training assets, but, but a larger conversation, being able to bring together um, different participants in, in the library space, from the national to the academic to the public, and, and have an engaged conversation of where those patterns were useful, not just within a particular constituency, but across them. To bring together folks from the rare book and manuscript, from the audiovisual, um, to bring together folks from, from the museum, from the archive space, start to really have a, a, a practical discussion around um, the needs of the community, the professional realities of what some of these standards had, 
implications for in terms of cataloging practices, staffing, change management, et cetera, and really uh, a, uh, um, a conversation that, that basically folks could come together and really sort of shape these standards. If you think of these standards as Legos, um, how they get assembled is not a single answer. So having the community shape these structures has been a key part of this, of this early community, early need that we've been hearing a lot of. Um, the professional practitioners work in this regard, at this particular point, um, we started this initiative roughly about a year ago. Um, in the next few months, we're going to be hitting 300 plus um, institutions, really, again, representing a wide range of folks sort of coming together to, to have that kind of dialogue and, and discourse related to what the impact of these technologies mean. But through the process of this, one of the um, evolving aspects of this was the set of, we need some practical tools to help us understand what it means to go from mark to a web of data. What, is, what, did, what does BibFrame mean? What does schema.org mean? What does all this mean to us? Um, and what, what these particular tools are designed and, and they're constantly evolving, in fact, uh, based on the community that, and feedback and, and contribution, really is a way of sort of taking our existing, um, in this particular case, the focus is Mark, but taking our existing data standards and projecting them into the web and starting to really understand what that particular means. So in this particular case, I'm looking at a sample set of Mark record from the National Library of Medicine, and I'm looking at this in the context of of going from um, you know 190 some mark records to 1400 interlinkable resources. So, in the particular case of that, okay, now I've got a whole bunch of resources. What would this look like to an end user? Was the next question that many folks basically kept asking. This was an attempt to sort of say, look, we can reassemble those assets in any number of ways, and this is one example of how the assembly of those assets um, uh, makes sense. Um, in another case, we can look at it through a different means. This is what the analysis of those assets look like in terms of, of focusing not just on the tr traditional bibliographic work, but now looking at it through sort of a collection mechanism. It, it wasn't so much to sort of say this is how we want to present this to the user, but the notion of deconstructing these resources and then choosing which resources we want to focus on, books, collections, people, subjects, any one of these might be a useful control point in which to start to look at all of the underlying data together. But taking a step back, what, what, what's been very helpful is to help people understand that as we move from a set of records to a set of interconnected web data, we move from you know, roughly in the upper right-hand corner, 200 records to 1,500 resources. On the left-hand side, those resources break down into different kinds of, 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 of resources. They materialize into different types. We can click on any one of these and see underlying the structure of this and see the properties that, that are reflected inside of MARC related to um, these particular types of resources. But one of the things that's helpful in terms of thinking about this from the web is that we've gone from you know, roughly 193 records to you know, 10 times that amount of resources in which we can in fact connect to. And not only that, but Mark has these relationships of, of how things connect. And if you start thinking about this from a set of resources that connect to other resources, and you start projecting this back into the web, we can, we can understand what the potential implications of this might be for us. So on the web, um, the majority of search engines, Google, Bing, et cetera, the way they do relevance ranking is based on, in fact, the number of links that, that, that point to something. So in the context of the web, a link is worth a thousand words. The more thing, the more links to something, the more relevant it is. And the value of the web is proportion of any resource is proportionate to those number of links. The number of links to it, not from it, the number of links to it. 
So if we start looking at MARC records as a set of interconnected resources and we start surfacing the number of links to those resources, we start to realize, in fact, actually we've got an incredibly connected set of data that, that drops very nicely into the way in which many services on the web, many search services in particular on the web, um, uh, organize content. So how connected are these? One of the things that, that, that uh, from working with these hundreds of different professionals, you know, the next questions that folks ask were, how connected is this stuff? Um, what, what, what areas, how, where can I actually increase my connectivity? Where, where do I benefit more from, from further connectivity? Um, and this is, um, through the course of those discussions, um, Zafir has been asked to create ways in which we can assess these collections and get a better sense of, of their webbiness in terms of increased visibility and discovery. Um, so not just breaking these resources down by the particular types, but, but starting to look at where these kinds of resources fold or connect or relate together. Um, in short, to find out just how connected a particular collection is, and in the context of that, find out how, what kinds of indicators we might have in terms of making this data, frankly, not just more visible on the web, but, but increasingly um, um, uh, more of a priority to, to, well, being more discoverable. So to go from just being on the web to, to actually being something in which, you know, folks see as a result when they basically start, you know, searching on the web. And looking at this from the context of not just how connected um, a particular asset or a particular collection might be, but, but really in the larger case of the opportunities in which many of us in the library community have been creating these control points. Um, OCLC, ORCID, the Food and Agriculture Organization, National Library of Medicine, World Health Organization, Getty, Library of Congress. This is a fraction of the number of organizations that have been surfacing identifiers that relate to our library space. Con things in which we could further connect to um, if our data was in, par in part more of a web environment that would allow for those connections, but, but also ways in which we could, if it, we made it easier to start to connect to these. Each one of these services, um, each one of these organizations reflect, in essence, roughly linked data control points, linked data authorities. The problem is every one of them does things differently. We've increased, we've made available these identifiers, but we've made it difficult, frankly, to sort of connect any of our current data or, frankly, you know, born digital data back into these particular services. One of the experimentations that we've done um, as well, again, from listening to, to, to the professionals sort of asking for new ways in which um, um, those kind of link accelerators could be accomplished is, is basically exploring new kinds of cataloging, prototyping, you know, link data interfaces. So this is a, a demonstrator of some open source infrastructure called Scribe that allows us to, as we type ahead in a subject or a person um, or any kind of, of, of value that might be useful in terms of one of these authority control points, um, we can, as we type ahead, instantly link into these particular um, services. The challenge that we had in terms of developing Scribe, again, is every one of these linked data authority services are different, but um, it, it, it's been a useful exercise in terms of proving the viability and value proposition of starting to treat each of these services as um, web control points and what we can do with the power of humans if we made it increasingly easy for folks to reconcile their data into these particular authority services. What's been equally valuable in terms of the, um, uh, the, the practical practitioners group isn't, frankly, even the technology, but at the, again, the sort of 
community and conversation that's, that's surrounding this. Um, as folks go through the, the training course, they graduate to alumni, they start to interact with each other. One of the um, uh, very fascinating stories of many um, has, has occurred from the, the, the Denver Public Library moving into the alumni. Uh, one of the things that they were interested in doing, again, the collection is, is only part of, of a library's perspective. Um, you know, Molly Brown is a, uh, uh, a very formidable icon in the um, Denver community. Um, the history of Molly Brown, the assets related to Molly Brown, um, um, the stories related to Molly Brown, um, museums, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, are in and around the Denver area. Um, the, the, the public library was sort of interested in exploring how one could raise the visibility of, of Molly Brown so that if folks were searching for this, they would know to go to Denver Library. They made this discussion um, uh, in the, the uh, alumni community the folks from George Washington University um, within less than a day um, have constituted a, a very sensible sort of interesting pulse around Bib Frame Fridays. Um, you know, got together, they saw this challenge, they, they mocked up all these different relationships that would exist between Molly Brown and a wide range of other kinds of addressable assets. And, and it's been um, you know, and within a very short amount of time, you start to see different perspectives on 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 this particular problem. Um, Gloria Gonzalez of, of Zafira sort of then took that uh, initial sketch from George Washington and 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 went back even further to not only sort of connect um, these relationships even further, but start to identify where these control points in fact, might be, and what control points, in fact, might make sense. And so this has been a sort of a very interesting intersection between, uh, you know, Denver Public, George Washington University, and Zafira in terms of sort of really sort of exploring what a web of different kind of bib frame data might look like that would, again, help increase the visibility of Denver, but not based on any one particular um, asset, per se, but rather on the connectivity of, of, of lots of assets related to a particular um, individual. And this is the kind of, of interesting social conversation that, that, that quickly you know, grows into um, um, a very exciting uh, community pattern. But if we take a step back and look at this, um, you know, we can, we can very definitively say, um, at, in the context of speaking like the web, if we reflect this data in these key linked data primitives, such as BibFrame, we have an opportunity of creating highly connected webs of data. We have, through that, the enormous potential for increasing connectivity through existing control points that, that we in the library community do better than anyone else. Um, in Zafira, we work with lots of different industries. The library community has a huge advantage in terms of the number of really powerful authoritative identifiers for people, places, subjects, etc. We, however, in our community are making that extremely difficult to connect to. So we've created these identifiers, but we're not making it easy in which we can sort of snap our different assets into um, those identifiers. And really, if we lower the costs of creating those linkings, we improve visibility. So we have the potential to speak like the web. We have the control points to speak like the web. The standards that we're putting in place help us accelerate our existing data in a way that folds together and links together quite nicely. But unfortunately, we are relatively completely dark from the way the web understands. Very close, but not quite there. So Act 3, I want to talk about visibility and, and transition this into now some practical next steps. In speaking with, with many of these professionals, um, we've heard, in essence, a very consistent 
clear story that I, I, I think Chuck Gibson has done a great job um, uh, at, at summarizing. Um, you know, it, it, it was very clear, you know, we're not interested in sort of, you know, beating Amazon or anybody else, but when my community that I'm serving searches the web for something we have, we better show up as an option. So in a very practical sense, if folks are willing to sort of do a quick experiment and just behind the scenes, I would suggest, you know, going to Google or Bing or wherever you feel comfortable with um, and, and searching, you know, your, your closest public library, whatever that might be, Harry Potter, and see if you get a bibliographic asset. You know, many libraries, in fact, don't return any asset. Our collections, for example, are just absolutely completely dark from the very web. You, you don't find anything. And, you know, Chuck's sort of made a very clear point. If, if we've got something, my users that are using the web to find stuff, we better just show up as an option. So that's the expectations from his perspective of library web visibility. And one of the things that, that has been increasingly clear is that, is that this is a problem that we have you know, just accepted over the past two decades and that we've become almost comfortable with. We've just sort of assumed there's nothing we can do or that, that we've, we've just recognized that, that it's just the way it is. Um, but, but we can't ignore this problem any longer. Increasingly, the communities in which we serve are using the web to find whatever there is to, that they're looking for. We show up as an option and we drive more people back to the library in which they can further then explore. And this is a very powerful way in which we can use global standards but serve a very local community need. And, and I think Chuck just did a great job sort of summarizing this. And that was really the basis for, um, in essence, the creating LibHub, is sort of recognizing that even, you know, at a very high level that everyone benefits from the visibility of libraries and the content on their web. So it's about making our libraries more visible to what the web understands, making our assets more visible to the way the web understands, and, and by leveraging the web uh, and where our users are searching, drive you know, more users back to us in which we can serve them better. And do this in a way that we can learn through action together. So this slide represents um, an initial set of libraries that have sort of stepped up and said, look, this is a problem. We want to address this head on. We're tired of talking about it. Let's do something. And, and we've been very fortunate to, to learn from each other um, through the course of the past couple months and with working with, with, with um, various different uh, uh, vendor and, and tool providers to really start to think, what are the practical accelerated ways in which we can start to expose our data in the way the web understands and benefit from that? But we're not there. We, we have this wealth of content we know, but we've locked it behind legacy systems and niche vocabularies. This made a lot of sense 40 years ago. It makes no sense now. And we know this. So we're basically sort of recognizing there's a problem and we're, and we're trying to figure out the best way of achieving that. So in order to basically achieve that most effectively, it's helpful to spend a little bit of time understanding what, what the web and how the web, in the context, as I mentioned, the web of data now works. So the traditional visible web focuses on harvesting and links to pages. So all of these additional resources that were individual web pages Traditionally, if I typed in Albert Einstein, I got a relevance rank based on the number of web pages in which most people sort of link to that. Uh, Wikipedia, for example, being a good example of, of one of the highest because as a, as a site, it's one of the ones that most people link to. What's happening um, increasingly a few years ago and more commonly now across the board is, is frankly the, the emerging invisible web that takes the data, resources, vocabulary, and connections behind these documents and aggregates them together. There is no one page that reflects what you see on the right-hand side of Google or Bing. This is an aggregation of data 
from a wide range of different services that all basically talk about, in essence, different aspects of Albert Einstein. That, that invisible web, that data web, is, is increasingly feed, it's fed by a wide range of different services, but the key parts of this is, is creating a more actionable web that allows that data to be increasingly integrated, aggregated, and, and new kinds of services um, performed on this. And what's happening in particular is a wide range of different industries are really taking advantage of this. Uh, in the retail industry, the notion of describing items, reviews, location, inventory, hours, et cetera, et cetera, all of these different um, uh, descriptive standards from different sources are being fed into um, these kinds of services. So when you look for retail information, it's dropping you in, these search services are dropping you in to not just the stores that have what you're looking for, but where you're located and, and, and things nearby you. In the particular um, uh, movie industries, again, different vocabularies being grafted together and, 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 and because we're using the web in this particular context, it's not just search engines that are taking advantage of this, but a wide range of, of different applications and, and, and uh, infrastructure, again, all built using these low-level web primitives and, you know, experimenting. I mean, how one um, uh, selects movies or restaurants, you know, is constantly being evolved. But the fact that th this, this area is so exciting at the moment is because increasingly restaurants, movies, retail are speaking the way in which the web understands and a wide range of innovation that is, is literally being explored to sort of support this and a, and, a, and a series of end user needs. How are libraries seen on the web? Right now, um, best case is we're viewed as a community business. Um, we have in a, a small fraction of libraries, locations, hours, um, reviews, et cetera, et cetera, but we're really viewed as a business. Um, and, that's, and that's frankly if at all. Um, you know, many majority, uh, many libraries are completely still invisible. That's just the libraries, not not the assets, not the collection, not the catalog, not the services, uh, not the capacities in which a library basically has. So, from an external perspective, from from um, my colleagues at at the search engines, um, you know, are websites and systems harvestable? Is there any unified accessible industry vocabulary that allows us to, to identify patterns among libraries? Are there strong connections and relationships that exist among these assets? And frankly, what is the consistency and reliability of the user experience to the available data? So, you know, when we want to be part of this larger discussion, these are the kinds of questions that we have to, to answer. This is unfortunately when we dig into a little deeper our catalog, and as I was mentioning earlier, um, you know, search your public library and, and Harry Potter. You know, this is really what we're dealing with now. If I'm searching for the Great Gatsby, as just an example, I'm, I'm not finding a library until you know 60 plus pages into a search result. Um, you know, and and this, in fact, this search was done prior to the movie being released. Now. You know, with the movie being released a, a year ago, you know, I'm 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 even further back and inundated with a tremendous amount of information related to Leonardo DiCaprio and and different things. But if I'm interested in any scholarly aspects of this, it's just not part of of a result set. Um, and I don't know anybody that basically goes 60 pages into a result set to to basically figure out what they're looking for. I know I would not have done it if it had been you know. If I, if I, if I lost a bet. And, and this is from a, from a visibility perspective, from a, from a library perspective, from a relevance perspective. If our users are going to the web to search um, and we're not showing up as a result and, and we're so hidden from this that, that you know, this is not acceptable. This is, we can do better. We have to do better. So, What's happening right now in terms of, of 
of some of the discovery standards is the ability to start to describe our assets in a way in which um, um, you know, libraries can or, or anyone can be more effectively discover on the web. Things like schema.org allow us to say this is a book. It allows us to say um, you know, this is what the book is about. It allows us to say you know, a wide range of additional things. And if we go from mark to schema.org, we can begin to say these particular things. But what we, what we say without thinking deliberately of what that mark to schema.org translation is, we create these potential islands of descriptive information because they're not linked together, because they're not connected together in a discoverable web way. So it's a huge step to say we're, we're basically making our assets visible and, and things like schema.org give us some of these opportunities, but what we want to do is not just make them visible, but make them connected to increase the discovery and sharing and visibility of these assets to a wide range of different services. So this is what the search engine harvester sees when we start to describe our assets. This is good. We've gone from just a generalized web page to a book. Um, what we want to do even more is start to connect those books to, you know, in essence, institutions that have them. But again, the, the web works not just, you know, the value of something isn't based on, on on the number of links out of a particular resource, but really the number of, way of links into a particular resource. So the ability of turning this around and starting to say that libraries now hold these particular books as new relationships um, start to increase the value proposition and the discovery of these particular assets. If we start to even describe our library systems like this that hold the Great Gatsby, we're no longer on page 60 we start to basically become a viable result for folks looking for these kinds of assets. And what's even best is we start to provide uh, the ability where not just libraries but individuals are interested in it, um, um, uh, our expanded notion of libraries to schools, um, uh, to churches, et cetera, et cetera, all basically start to connect to this. We start to have a shared way in which in which these control points become the, the linkable assets to a larger discussion of, of bibliographic citation and description. And in doing that, we increase the visibility, not just of our libraries, but of our assets as well. Again, this notion of a link is worth a thousand words. We have all of these links inside of, of our data. We have all of these relationships inside of our uh, industry, but we are doing a poor job of linking them together to increase the visibility. When that happens, we see a tremendous amount of things. We see this right now um, when we search for products in the search services at the moment. If I search for Dell laptops, I see a very powerful consolidation occur because Search services don't want to dominate any one single page with every particular thing. If you, if you search, for example, for a particular company, you're not going to see every web page that might link to that. You see these great exam examples of sort of consolidation. If we start exposing our library assets in a similar way, we, we can, we're not gaming the system. We're not asking Google or Bing or Yahoo or Yandex to do anything different than what they're doing, but we can start to basically take advantage of these um, services. So not only searching on the Great Gatsby um, would would start to basically increase libraries. If we if we all came together, we could not only um, find ourselves in an interesting situation where we're increasingly discoverable. But, but take advantage of, of a tremendous amount of efforts related to um, geolocation and aggregation and libraries near you kinds of services. So it's not asking the web to do anything different. It's simply by speaking into the web the way the web understands, we 
start to take advantage of other systems and infrastructures in ways that, that other industries have already basically blazed the path. And we're very close to this to be happening. Um, the signal that, that we are moving from a, a record-based interchange format to a data-based interchange format, a, a record-to-resource standard, the mark-to-bib frame uh, transition, a very powerful, uh, I won't say technical, I'll say social process. Um, you know, we ha are changing the way as an industry um, we're going to be sharing bibliographic information. And that, and that social signal is a very important one. There's an economic one. Um, you know, frankly, we are spending money with um, tools and services that aren't giving us the value that we're being asked um, from our patrons. So again, working with hundreds of different professionals, um, you know, you know, we're hearing over and over a need for new ways in which our data assets can be discovered by, by others, and in the process of that discovery, um, once they get here, how do we keep them? And increasingly actionable, finally, uh, uh, the web. I mean, the, the, we've been working on a web of data, um, you know, the ideas, the concepts, the tools, the technologies, the standards for, you know, quite some time. Um, the latest, um, you know, signal in terms of things like schema.org, um, Facebook's open graph, this is great indicators and, and very powerful um, end user applications of what that kind of data really can enable. So we have the right infrastructure, we have the right components, um, uh, and, and what's exciting about this is, is they're all very close. So we have this notion of bib frame of purpose and promise, the purpose being it's replacing Mark, but the promise being so much more the purpose of serving libraries, but the promise of relating memory organizations and, and the users they serve, not just serving libraries, but, but other institutions and organizations related to the space and the community that is looking for this data. Um, BibFrame is building off of a set of existing web standards to speak with a consistent voice. The purpose of that is to sort of lower costs, lower effort. The promise, though, is increased visibility, discovery, and effectiveness. If we look at the differences in the spectrum of description and discovery standards, I'm, 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 I'm conscious of the fact that this webinar is in the context of, of the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative. DCMI has been, since its inception, grappling with this continuity of description and discovery. Um, there are a lot of descriptive standards that, that are not effective discovery standards. There are not a lot of descriptive standards that are not web friendly. Uh, what BibFrame provides is a way in which we can start projecting those rich description standards in a rich web description framework that projects incredibly well to whatever discovery standard makes sense. Schema.org being today, but something else being tomorrow. Or different projections related to different kinds of mobile, tablets, web-based, et cetera, et cetera, trajectories. This gives us a way in which we can project a tremendous amount of our description practices in a web framework that easily not only takes advantage of, of existing discovery vocabularies, but a web architecture of linking that, that really accelerates that visibility. And if we look at libraries not just as their content and collection, as I mentioned, but their capacities, their descriptions, the services that are behind them, fulfillment, for example, as well as Harry Potter, their collection. If we look at this holistically, we can start to um, quickly create ways in which not only can we project that information in the way the web understands, but, but do this across and in a consistent voice across lots of different libraries, connect these together, and in essence create an accelerated way in which we provide with a consistent voice, identifiers, relationships, vocabularies that a wide range of different search services or aggregation services, et cetera, basically can build off of. Each one of these things, Google, Bing, Yelp, Foursquare, 
create identifiers that are specific to every one of these libraries, the notion of how we tie this together, how we link this up, is a very strong challenge. If we give those services a way in which we say, this is how we define ourselves, this is how we identify ourselves, this is how we identify our assets, this is how we identify our, the, the relationships, we have a much more concentrated but much more coherent and much more powerful voice to really drive our assets into a wide range of different discovery layers. And this is in fact what LibHub is. So in the summer of 2015, we will announce, based on those icons that I was talking about, a LibHub network, which is a web-based data network designed to surface and connect libraries and their resources in a visible and actionable fashion. Inside of this network, each library will have its own set of data optimized for linking across its own library, but also in a way that links across other libraries. And within that larger context, we will go from not just increased visibility, but our hope and our goal is to really transform the industry and to really make our library assets available to the web, to people in a connected and usable fashion. You know, to deliver our assets where users are, however they're looking for them. Again, and do this based on the web. Not a vocabulary necessarily, but the web architecture. Vocabularies are important, data is important, but linking is critical. A key part of this is also recognizing, let's not be too clever. It's not about gaming a system. It's not about optimizing to any one service. It's about speaking in the way the web understands and benefiting from what this enables. This slide is a bit dated, but what is happening right now, we should just be very clear. Things that are happening inside of, of Google, Microsoft, etc., you know, inside of garages across the country, we're innovating and exploring and 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 testing a wide range of new ways in which we're going to be delivering content. Um, this was an example of a new way in, in which Google was exploring content that is increasingly becoming, you know, a variant of which uh, standard now. But the point is, is that it's not about us trying to map this to any one search service or map this to any one discovery service, but rather to speak in the way the web understands and allow a wide range of different applications really to take advantage of this and explore. And, and together we're going to see what works and what doesn't. So LibHub is about making this global network possible, but it's also about uh, building on existing investments, building on the trajectories of, of linked data and libraries, projecting these way into a way in which the web understands, and building off of the web's cooperative infrastructure to really help the web understand libraries and our legacy systems. We have legacy systems. This isn't about putting them away and, and sort of replacing them necessarily with something else. It's a way about sort of exposing these legacy systems in a way the web understands and connecting things back into this. A tremendous amount of credit card information is processed right now on IBM mainframes and COBOL uh, programs. It's not about replacing those systems, but it's about exposing those, that kind of systems to the web so that new transactions can occur. We can do the same things in libraries. We have existing systems. These are very powerful. We can begin to expose the data behind those systems in a way in which, however, we can drive new traffic back into our libraries. And through that process of increased visibility, start to explore how we want to rethink our services, our capacities, our capabilities, and really the library of the future going forward. What we can do right now, so you know, we hear a lot of requests of, of how best can we, you know, you know what can we do now? Um, this is, you know, in, in no ways a, a prioritized list, but just a few quick five points. You know, inside of your library right now, take a critical look at your web footprint. You know, how are you being viewed on the web? Do you have a, you know, a, a Bing knowledge card or a global knowledge graph knowledge card? Go ahead, start creating Wikipedia entries for your library. Google+, Facebook, Yelp, 
These are data assets that in fact actually are syndicated and created and used in new ways in which these, these kinds of, of, of new web footprints and new discovery layers and new knowledge graphs are enabled. It's a tedious task um, and in fact we hope to accelerate a lot of that through things like LibHub, but, but this is something you can do right now. Understand your gap between your catalog and the web. You know, search for you know, your favorite public library and Harry Potter. Don't be surprised that if you don't see your catalog, but you do see your blog post about something. Blogs are designed to be optimized for the web. Our catalogs are not, but it gives you a good understanding of what the challenges are related to exposing our catalogs to the web. There's a lot of new tools that are coming online that are sort of exploring different ways in which legacy tools and, 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 and existing tools that we're comfortable with can be adapted and, ex and, and, and used to create this larger pattern. Terry Reese has done some great work um, on uh, not just Mark Edit, but a, a new project he's um, exploring called Mark Next. Um, so for those that are familiar with Mark Edit, there are some plugins now that you can basically, you know, continue to use the tools you're familiar with, but click a button and publish this information to the web. Um, some of Evergreen's work um, in particular, Dan Scott's exploration of integrating some of the schema.org vocabulary in Evergreen. If you're looking at new ILS systems, I'd encourage you to take a look at Dan's work in this regard. He's done some good work in terms of, instead of dealing with, um, you know, uh, existing ILS systems, you know, let's, let's weave this into the very fabric of open source ILS systems. If you're not looking for new ILS systems, um, but you still want to basically you know, get involved or, 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 you know, keep informed of what's going on. Express your support for this kind of, of library visibility work at LibHub and get involved. Um, you know, if you're a library that's interested in exploring and being part of this network, let us know. If you want more information on, on practical um, practicing, you know, and training, get involved. Join the lists. Have these discussions. I love the notion of Bib Frame Fridays, of bringing together folks and and starting to think, how would I describe my reading room? How would I describe my capacity at my library? How would I describe, um, you know, my catalog? These are all key points at sort of small steps. There's not a single solution. This is all of us coming together, and, and all of our perspectives count. And finally, just to sort of drive this last point home, I strongly encourage folks to think about the incremental value, small steps that show value every step of the way. If you're waiting for the full solution, you're going to be disappointed until the full solution is there. But there are some small steps that we can take that will show instant value and, and increasing the way in which we will be part of how the web sees us going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Um, for those of you that can stay with us for a bit, uh, you can type questions into the uh, 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 into the box. Um, I have one. While some questions are coming in, um, can you say a little bit more about the mark to bib frame shift? And what are the major pushbacks? Uh, what are the recognized impediments? Is it simple lack of knowledge, skill? What? Hey, um, uh, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think that, uh, um, I mean, first and foremost, you know, we have 45 plus years of, of MARC data. And one of the things that's been, you know, I mean, and we should just be, we should recognize the, the power of this. There's no other data standard that's been around as long as MARC. Um, but it's not MARC as a standard that's been, um, so powerful, it's been the community behind it and the ability to change and evolve and adapt and extend and expand, et cetera, et cetera. One of the challenges that, that we have in any kind of conversion um, from MARC records to web resources is several things. One is, um, uh, you know, inconsistencies in our data or, or the challenges of how things relate but you know, they're reflected in, in a way that we can't um, easily do in an actionable way. So I'm going to describe the relationship between this resource and another, but I'm going to do it in prose via a notes field. 
So, so there are some simple things we can do in terms of conversions. Um, you know, the 100s, the 600s, you know, the 700s, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Starting to relate these things to people, to places, to concepts, um, to other assets. But there's a lot of challenges that still remain, frankly, in terms of of just the fact that Mark has evolved and changed over the past several years, and um, the relationships that we want to tease out of this, in fact, are are encapsulated in a in a particular way that don't lend themselves immediately to um, uh, computational transformation. They're really going to require us as humans to go back and and start to add additional value. The the nice part of that, just to just to be clear, is in this particular case of the web, once one person starts to draw relationships um, between these resources and makes these corrections or makes these additions, um, you know, this movie was based on this book, and 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 now has created a new relationship that exists between these different bibliographic assets. Like the web, we can project this in a way in which you know, simply the next person takes advantage of. So there is going to be a critical human part of this moving forward that, that, that the computational transform won't be able to handle. But in fact, our hope is, um, again, like a community, we, we, one of us makes these additional relationships, the rest of us benefit from it. So it's, it, we, we see a lot of, 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 of opportunity in which we can accelerate you know, these additional linkages and additional connections that we as a community start to create. Here is another question, Eric. Is there an open communication channel that those of us working to make traditional MARC-based systems like Evergreen speak in the language of the web, whilst we slowly work towards supporting something like BibFrame, can use to help collaboratively build a set of best practices uh, best practices for a central decentralization uh, parallel to LibHub. Okay, there are many such channels, but it would be great if there was one that we could know that LibHub people were particularly active in as well. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, one of the things that we've been talking about in the context of LibHub um, that we'll be talking about in the next couple of weeks at ALA is a sort of a sponsorship and partnership agreement with you know, a wide range of different vendors and tools to sort of help accelerate this. If there's a quick question on, on, on Evergreen or, or other kinds of things, if you're looking for sort of best practices, if you don't want to wait for all these particular discussions, I mean, there are some very simple things that I think are just huge steps right now that one could almost think of as best practices for linked data in MARC, right? Um, you know, in the 100 fields, in the 600 fields, in the 700 fields, you know, the subfield zero that talks about, um, um, you know, authority identifiers. Use, identi use URLs. Use HTTP colon slash slash vof.org slash la or, you know, id.lock.gov. Ah. Use web-based identifiers um, in the context of, of our MARC records. And as we start to think about projecting, whether it's natively through um, uh, open source infrastructure like Evergreen or uh, Quali LA or um, through intermediary um, wrappers like LibHub is providing for other vendors for these various libraries, we will have easy ways in which we can start creating these linkages and connections among these resources. So if you're, if you're going through the process of of, of starting to um, describe Mark right now and using these um, you know, authoritative IDs in the subfield zeros, you know, uh, you know, just use HTTP URIs and you go a long way. As far as the forms go and as far as the discussions go, um, uh, you know, unfortunately there's not one single place for, for, for that uh, conversation to happen, but that is a conversation that if, if you're part of LibHub, um, you know, we will, there will be forms for that particular discussion that, that, again, our hope is to sort of increase, you know, it's not to say there's only one way of doing this, do LibHub. LibHub isn't a single solution. We will be providing some solutions, 
but ultimately our hope is in fact you know through these various different tools and through um, various different services we can agree to project our data in a common way in which the web understands and 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 project our and and to maximize the linkages um, among our data assets because the combination of the vocabularies and the linkages are really what's what's key here it's not a single solution there are lots of solutions but we want to just make sure that that of all the, the solutions we're doing as consistently the same thing when it comes to linking and exposing as possible to really sort of maximize the network effect of libraries in the web. Uh, Eric, how do you see the BibFrame vocabulary interacting with the schema.org vocabulary to result in web visibility? Oh, it's simple. Uh, it, I mean, BibFrame provides a really, really powerful way in which we can create, you know, descriptive standards. As we want to project those standards um, to the web, schema.org gives us a great way of, of reflecting um, BibFrame into schema.org. It gives us a great way of projecting our, our data assets into a vocabulary the way the web understands. The BibFrame model helps us formalize the linkages that exist between there and the combination of those linkages and schema.org vocabulary you know takes us a long way what's equally important however is to recognize that this vocabulary is based on generalized frameworks RDFA micro formats if we don't have vocabularies that fit nicely into schema.org we can still project those additional richer vocabularies using those RDFA patterns which will allow the search engines to still pick that data up and still do actionable things with it. Schema.org gives us a consistent way of reflecting some of this but it's RDFA, it's, it's these ways in which schema.org, that vocabulary is reflected in the HTML that gives us a way in which we can extend this to a wide range of different needs. BibFrame gives us the raw framework that we can then project to to schema.org plus whatever we want. I see these very much as complementary, especially when we talk about web visibility. We need to get to a linking framework first. This is what BibFrame provides. We then project it into a way in which the web understands, which is RDFA. Schema.org is a vocabulary in that context. Um, but for we don't want to just dumb it down to that or just limit ourselves to that. We want to express our data in the richness in which it deserves. Eric, do you know of any library consortia that are becoming involved in the LibHub efforts? Um, I, I don't know of any library consortia um, yet. I mean, we, we are still talking with lots of consortia. Um, certainly, if there are consortia represented, that would be um, um, uh, I, I'd love to discuss. The consortia discussions, um, I mean, just not stating anything that anyone doesn't know, consortia generally take longer to decide than individual libraries. Um, we're moving very quickly. We're, we're, we're showing value very quickly. Um, our goal is to, uh, frankly, move the needle in terms of visibility and discovery um, in a very quick and effective and, and efficient manner. Uh, so it's not terribly surprising that, that the majority of early adopters in, in, in LibHub are um, libraries that have been very progressive in their, in their community and very progressive in the um, um, uh, you know different aspects of of, of their of, of of the industry um, consortia generally um, are fast followers uh, but if any consortia out there that are interested in um, really sort of you know accelerating their value proposition you know certainly we'd love to talk Eric, will tools like schema.org and bfscribe make description standards such as RDA and EAD less needed? Will LibHub support the creation of data as well? 
actually two questions there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so you know, I, I don't know if there'll be, so EAD, um, I, I mean, look, each of these standards have, have, have grown up for very specific reasons. And I think it's important for us when we start to think about whether something will replace one thing or another to sort of understand what those reasons are. Um, I think right now there's a strong case to be made of thinking about um, uh, more effective ways in which we can, you know, break down the barriers between, you know, the data assets that are encoded specifically to a particular standard because we see the value proposition in linking across these assets. Our users, my children, you know, when they do a search for, when they, when they have to do a report for Abraham Lincoln, aren't looking at this from the standpoint of, okay, what's my library say, what's my museum say, what's my archive say? They're looking at an, an answer that helps encapsulate all of those different perspectives. And they're not even thinking about libraries, museums, and archives. They're just thinking about Abraham Lincoln. So our standards have, have grown up in the same sort of institutional practices that our, that our institutions have. But we, we have to think about ways in which we can sort of cross that. Again, I think there's an opportunity to start looking at um, how we can project EAD, et cetera, VRA, et cetera, into um, a more web-like framework that accelerates linkages among me memory organizations and across memory organizations, and then begin to project that into ways in which, um, you know, search engines, et cetera, can take advantage of it. But I, 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 I caution us in the same way that, that, you know, again, from the lessons learned at Dublin Core, there's, a, there's a, an important continuum here on the description to discovery side. There's a, there's, a, there's a potential desire to go straight to, oh, I'm just going to project it to, you know, schema.org or whatever, but if we don't think about maximizing the linkages, if we don't think about how we sort of connect these assets together, we're not, we're making our individual resources perhaps more visible, but we're putting up those same silos that make the actual data to our end users, you know, not relevant. So it's not just about, our goal isn't just about increasing visibility, but that's a start. But, but it's increasing visibility in a way that maximizes the effectiveness of our, of our assets. And that's an important part of this. So I, 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 I caution people to think about, yes, there's any number of ways of projecting it into any number of vocabularies. How best we do it requires some actual some critical thinking and some understanding of why linking among our community is so important. And that's actually what I see as a really powerful way of bib frame. It's not so much as a, a mark replacement, even though I understand that it's a desire for um, uh, 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 many in our industry to think about, uh, you know, replacing one thing for another. But I think of it as a resource, as a framework that really sort of maximizes the connectivity and and the intersection and the effectiveness of of how these different resources that we've created both across the library community but beyond can start to connect together. And, and schema.org gives us a great way of projecting into that. BidFrame gives us a great way of, 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 of framing that. That's why I'm so excited and, so, and, and have so much promise in LibHub. We're so close to this that I think with only a very small amount of effort, we can actually demonstrate some very amazing and significant changes. As far as the, the second question, which is I think related to cataloging, this is just to be very clear, our focus is on visibility and discovery. Our focus is really on increasing the visibility of our assets and driving them into um, you know, the locations and the libraries and the organizations that have them. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about what you could do next, but I want to caution us you know, to be very clear and say, look, let, let us stay absolutely focused in terms of increasing the value proposition of our assets through a very um, key objective. From that, you know, we can discuss later. But, but I, think, I think many of, many library projects in particular, not just library projects in general, 
run the risk of thinking about so many different multi-sided aspects that that we sometimes lose sight of of sort of the, the, the key one that sort of drives everything else. And when I think about linked data adoption in the library community and that jumping the chasm and how to basically go from early adopter to mainstream, it's important to sort of think about what is the key differentiator, what is the key value proposition, what is the what is the one thing that would help drive a tremendous amount of, of new things. And we just from talking with you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of professionals the, the key theme that we kept hearing was visibility. So that's that's really LibHub's objective at the moment. And you know, I, I think other things will come out of this, but if we can help, you know, increase you know traffic to every library by a thousand percent, I think, you know, all of a sudden, you know, our conversations start to change about, you know, what that what what next step opportunities really make the most sense. Well, Eric, I think we're going to have to thank you here. Uh, we still have over 12 questions in the queue, and perhaps uh, we can uh, respond to those individually to, uh, to the uh, questioners. Uh, thank you very much for a very exciting webinar, and thank you very much for all of you that have held with us here for an hour and a half. So, that's thank it. Thank you, Stuart. It's been an absolute pleasure. And to those that are still on the webinar, the recording and the presentation slides will be made available within 48 hours of the broadcast, and it will be sent via follow-up email from GoToWebinars. And thank you, Eric, and thank you, Stuart, and thank you, Zafira, for this webinar, and have a great day, everyone.